Thank you everyone for joining us. We're going to kick off the webinar now. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this chat. Uh, we're joined by Michelle Dickinson and Ron Oram. And it's a chance for us to hear more about their stories of connecting more with New Zealand. They're both people that have been in New Zealand for a while, but they came, came from offshore. And it's a chance for us to hear about their experiences of settling and innovating from New Zealand. Hey, um, Michelle and Rod, do you, do you want to just say a brief hi? We'll, um, and we'll, we'll come back in more depth a bit later, but do you want to just kick off by, by, um, by saying hi in a brief sort of intro? Okay, I'll go first. I, I'm Michelle. Uh, I have been in New Zealand for almost 10 years now. I'm an engineer and nanotechnologist, and I am happy to answer any questions you have um, later on. Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, I'm uh, Rod Oram. I'm a business journalist here in New Zealand, and um, I've been here now 21 years, uh, originally from the UK, but then US and Canada, um, and um, I'm an ed Edmund Hillary Fellow, and, and very much looking forward to the discussions with you. Thanks, Rod and Michelle. A few housekeeping things before we jump in. So firstly, we are recording this conversation, and that'll be so that we can share this with some others that have registered for the call but aren't able to join us right at the moment. And also, we'll post it on YouTube afterwards so others can view it. So um, we'll be conscious of that. We'll try not to mention your, your full names or anything that will identify you if, unless you um, unless you want that. And um, the other thing is just in terms of broad kind of um, our, our plan for today. So I'm just going to start in the first five or 10 minutes, just kind of giving a bit of an EO, EHF 101, just kind of setting the scene for what the fellowship is. And then we'll open up for Rod and Michelle and we'll hear their experiences of moving to New Zealand and, and um, innovating from here. We are keen to get your questions um, so we can keep this an ongoing discussion. The best way for you to do that is there's a Q&A box which should be somewhere on your menu, um, likely down the bottom depending on what type of um, operating system you're running. So if you have questions at any point, chip, um, fire them away and then we'll either post them to uh, Michelle and Rod or I can cover some of them, some of them off as well. Um, so do keep them coming. I'm going to start by giving a five or 10 minute intro into EHF. So I'm going to talk about the fellowship and what that involves. And then secondly, going to talk a little bit more about if you are interested in the fellowship, what's involved in terms of applying and the process of becoming a fellow. So EHF is building a glo global community of change makers. Um, and the idea is that we'd have people so solving global challenges from New Zealand. Um, New Zealand is a great place to incubate new ideas and can be a launch pad to scaling those um, globally. This slide shows a bit about actually what does it involve being part of the fellowship. So let me unpack each of these briefly. So every six months we have our New Frontiers summits and they bring together a bunch of our fellows for, across different cohorts as well as other innovators and entrepreneurs and government stakeholders in New Zealand. So for people who are part of the fellowship, they're welcome to join um, each of those summits as a way of reconnecting. Also, for those that are first, um, first offered a place in the fellowship um, or you know, newly offered a place in the fellowship, they'll come to New Zealand for what we call Welcome Week. And they'll spend a bunch of time connecting with their cohort, um, as well as joining the New Frontiers Summit. Also, we have regional gatherings. So for example, in Wellington, we have a monthly dinner with fellows. Um, and as we get more and more fellows across the country, we'll have, um, we'll have more connections able to be, to be done um, by fellows in particular locations. Thirdly, we have, an, we have online tools for connecting fellows with each other. Um, so, and there are discussion topics by, for example, geography, you know, which place in New Zealand you're based, or by cohort, um, or by which particular topics that you're working on. A key part about the fellowship as well is the informal collaboration that happens between the fellows. Um, so for example, one of our fellows who's doing work to, um, to build theme parks that are educational came to me and was asking if we have any fellows that are doing work with renewable technologies because she wanted to demonstrate that with one of, the, um, one of the theme parks. And then I was able to introduce her to uh, a fellow who's, who's a leader in terms of wind technology. So that's just an example of the kind of 
um, the kind of connections that can happen across different topics of fellows meeting with each other. And then fourth, the EHF team is here to help support you. And that involves helping support you as you transition to come to New Zealand for the first time, supporting you in terms of connecting you with people from New Zealand that might make sense for you to connect with. And it could be startups or incubators or um, science organizations in New Zealand as well. Here are a few photos. This is from a New Frontiers Summit uh, a year or two ago. Here's a little bit about the Global Impact Visa. So, uh, and how it works is that people apply for the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, and if they're offered a place, then they can then apply for a Global Impact Visa. Key things to say about the Global Impact Visa, one is that it's very flexible. It enables you to work and invest and to um, even certain types of study um, and to start up new ventures. And we don't necessarily hold you to a particular business plan. Um, Sorry. Thanks. Um, maybe if you could hop on mute, um, Rob. Yeah, um, um, so uh, we don't hold you to follow the specific business plan that you submitted. So it's, it's open for you to, um, to, do, to do different things because we understand the, the path to creating a, a venture is not always linear. Um, people who become fellows who are internationals can apply and get the Global Impact Visa. Um, for their family members, there are additional visas available for family members like partner visas for example also the global impact visa after three years there's the opportunity for people to apply for permanent residency um, and it's much more um, much more simple process of applying for permanent residency from the global impact visa compared to a number of other um, ways of of applying for permanent residency that's a bit about the global impact visa um, next, I'll briefly dis discuss what's involved in terms of um, connecting with the fellowship if you're keen to apply and what's involved in the selection process. So the, in terms of selection criteria, there are five key things that we look at and you can find these on our website at ehf.org forward slash apply. So the first one is having a bold vision to solve systemic challenges. So a, a couple of things to note there, we're after people that are doing things that are innovative. And what we mean by systemic challenges is some of the big problems facing society. Um, so if you're working on things that have the potential to get to some of the, um, get, get to some of the heart of big problems, then that's, um, that's interesting to us. Secondly, and very importantly, as well as people's ability to deliver on their vision. So just having um, ideas isn't enough. It's, um, for us, it's important that you can show that you can actually get things off the ground. And you can do that in a bunch of different ways. You can do that through having done it on your current venture. So being able to show what you've, what, you've, what kind of progress you've made so far, um, as well as previous things that you've been involved with. That could be previous ventures or previous work or previous voluntary work that you've done. Um, so we have a, we try and keep a broad lens in terms of um, how you can demonstrate your ability to get things done and create change. Fourth, we're looking for people who can build long-term connections with New Zealand. And there are different ways to do that. One obviously is coming and permanently moving to New Zealand, but also, um, sometimes people can find ways to meaningfully connect with New Zealand um, beyond permanently basing themselves here. So some people come for part of their time um, and they find ways to open up their networks and funding that can help benefit New Zealand. Fourth, we're up for people who are keen to contribute to the EHF community and be great cohort members as part of, as part of the EHF cohort. Uh, and then finally, people who will be good ambassadors for New Zealand. As I mentioned before, you can see more of this at ehf.org forward slash apply. Here's a bit about key dates for the fourth cohort. So the application deadline is the 2nd of September. So that's a key date if you're keen to apply for the fourth cohort. Then the application process goes through September through late November, maybe even to early December. And then we announce to people uh, around late November, early December, who's offered a place in the fellowship. Then for those who are internationals, their, um, the next step for them is to apply to Immigration New Zealand for the Global Impact Visa. And then we welcome our cohort four fellows to New Zealand in March next year. Um, and it's, it's not the case you need to permanently move by March or move your venture, um, but we expect all of those who are part of cohort four to um, be coming to their welcome week in March. And then after that, the, the fellowship um, begins. And um, next we're gonna talk about, a little bit more about the steps involved in the selection process. 
So the first step is submitting an online application and that's before 2nd of September, as we mentioned. Then for those who are shortlisted, we ask a bunch of people to join a video interview and that's a chance for us to get to know you some more. Then for those shortlisted, we follow up with references. And then um, the final step is that we, um, we at the team at EHF put forward information to our independent selection panel, uh, summarizing all the information that we've learned through our selection process. And then it's the independent selection panel that make the final decisions about who's offered a place in the fellowship. So to apply uh, before the 2nd of September, go to ehf.org forward slash apply. There's also an opportunity there at ehf.org forward slash connect to let us know a bit about yourself and then we can make contact with you after that. In terms of fees for international entrepreneurs, it's $600. Um, but if you have additional team members who are also applying to EHF, it's $400 per team member. Investor applicants, it's, it's 1,100. Uh, there, there, are, there are significant discounts for New Zealand applicants as well. Um, for, there are fees payable when you apply, but also for those that are offered a place in the fellowship, there's a fee applicable there, um, except for those um, who are um, New Zealanders. Um, and you can learn more about those fees at ehf.org forward slash apply. So key dates here, um, to apply for cohort four applications close on the 2nd of September and um, welcome week where we welcome fellows to New Zealand that's in March next year. Okay that is the end of our whirlwind EHF 101 in, in um, five or ten minutes. Now we're going to pass with the slides and uh, we'll set it up so that we can, um, we can um, chat with, with Michelle and with Rod. Um, okay, here we go. Um, hey, Rod, how about we start with you in terms of um, maybe if no, maybe maybe how we'll do it actually is we'll we'll talk to both of you and we'll start with what did you what did you expect before you came to New Zealand? <laughs> right, I'll jump straight in. Um, I had never had any intention of coming to New Zealand. Um, I was very happily involved um, in a terrific job in London and I was cold called one day about a job opportunity in New Zealand and my initial response was no no I, I'm very happy here at the Financial Times I've been here for a long time I don't want to go to New Zealand but um, I thought well no I, I should hear what's on offer so um, to cut a very long story short um, what my wife and I um, understood as we were talking to some New Zealand friends um, in London was that if we made the switch from London to New Zealand we'd be trading in um, very large scale um, in terms of the stories I was doing at the Financial Times or her work as an actress um, and so the scale would be smaller here but crucially we would gain dimension so um, at the FT the stories I wrote were about major companies doing big things but in a sense though I hope good quality, it was still kind of a two-dimensional view of uh, business and the economy. And um, I hoped that in moving to New Zealand, um, I would get to know far more people and try to keep a, a, an entire mental model, if you like, um, going in my head about uh, this country as a, an economy and a society. Um, and same um, situation for Lynn too. So that was our expectation uh, when we came and um, that's been very very richly fulfilled um, over that time and um, in terms of the range of people we know here, um, the activities we get involved in um, are all much more diverse and um, in many ways more rewarding um, because of the, the connection and and the intimacy of the country um, versus um, working at a larger scale but in a, in a rather more two-dimensional way in the UK and so that's been essentially um, the huge pleasure um, for me and my family of becoming New Zealanders but um, also it's something which keeps growing so here's this whole new phase for me now as an Edmund Hillary Fellow um, and so this seems to be a, an evergreen opportunity for me um, despite the time I've already been here in New Zealand. Thanks, Rod. How about you, Michelle? So I, I actually didn't have any expectations before I moved to New Zealand. I was probably quite naive in that I saw it as a very pretty place where they spoke English. And that, was, that was good enough for me. Uh, I moved here. I was living in the US before here. 
Um, but I had also lived in England for 10 years before that. And people had described New Zealand to me as a bit like living in Wales. So I thought, well, that sounds lovely. I'd spent some time in Wales. Um, and so I was very naive. And I was so pleasantly surprised and um, delighted when I actually moved here. And, and it took me a while to settle in. I reckon it took me two years to really figure out what New Zealand was and how it worked um, and then once I did I really flourished and met some amazing people and and one of the things that I have found about living in New Zealand versus living anywhere else is connection to people is not only so powerful but so easy here it literally is everybody does know everybody and so you can find the person that you want to connect with quite easily which I've struggled with in other countries so um, my expectations were pretty low because I didn't really know what to expect. I guess, you know, I thought it was a bit like Australia and I'd spent some time traveling there, um, but maybe with friendlier people. But it's ended up being this amazing place filled with innovation and passionate, positive people who really are here to, to make um, a significant change for the better. Thanks, Michelle. And uh, any other thoughts from either of you in terms of what was unexpected? coming to New Zealand. Michelle, it sounds like you didn't come with strong expectations and, you know, the kind of the, the positive surprise, I guess, of being able to connect with people more quickly and, and deeply. But um, any, other, any other surprising things that you found about New Zealand that you may, maybe wouldn't have expected when you first arrived or, or before you came? Supermarkets. Like, it sounds really silly. And I host a lot of new immigrants now. And so I see this all the time. Supermarkets in New Zealand close on strange days. And I still don't really understand it. But I think it's Easter Sunday. Anyway, you'll find that some days the supermarkets are closed. Um, and you're not expecting it. And then suddenly you can't buy food. And I think it's only at Easter now. But that was the thing that surprised not only me the most, but whenever new people come here, it's always the thing that catches them by surprise. Um, um, in many ways, the... Now, biggest surprise for me is, well, two. two. The first one is um, I was hoping in coming to New Zealand, I would be closer to the action in Asia, um, which was slightly counterintuitive because London to Seoul was a shorter distance than sort of Seoul to um, uh, Auckland. Um, but of course, um, Asia means um, a huge um, amount to us. It's a, a very big influence on us. And um, so I found that connection with Asia um, a deeply fascinating one. And um, I feel, um, whilst the plane rides are a bit long when you want to go anywhere else, um, it's sort of a great sense of connection um, with people, not just in our region, but around the world. The second thing is um, the very powerful impact of um, our um, indigenous culture on us. So I was aware of Maori before I came, but um, as each year goes by, um, that becomes more and more um, a defining thing for me as a new, uh, 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 a Europe, an ex-European um, New Zealander. Not that um, I am, um, trying to be Maori or um but that but the sense of um place in the world um that that creates um that I very strongly relate to in many ways um and I think uh quite significantly defines us as a country so as a very small country four and a half million people in a world of seven and a half billion and I think that um does give us um uh, a sense of place and a sense of where we stand in the world and I think that in turn then gives us um, an increasing sense of strength about how we can be welcoming to others and um, play a role in the world and um, so that's that second one has been uh, I think the most powerful thing for me overall. And so I should give a sensible one then. My sensible one, <laughs> other than supermarkets closing, um, is how multicultural it is here in New Zealand. Like I think uh, I was really surprised at literally how it's, I mean, Auckland is one of the most multicultural cities in the world and it's incredible because you have access to this amazing um, group of people from, from everywhere. And, and I think being an immigrant, um, sometimes I've struggled when I've immigrated to other countries to to fit in or feel like I was welcome here. But um, New Zealand is, is filled with amazing people from amazing places who have a story of travel and journey and moving to a new place for a reason. And so I think that is a really special thing.
Mm. I'll just uh, um, add a couple of reflections on that because I, I think that's uh, fundamentally important. Uh, sorry, it's the business journalist in me about to quote some statistics, some data. Um, Auckland is the fourth most immigrant intensive city in the world after, in order, um, Toronto, Vancouver, and Brussels. And um, uh, so 43% of us who live here in Auckland were born outside New Zealand. Um, and yet, so far, and I think this will continue, um, our ability to um, assimilate people um, uh, works. And I see this particularly um, in New Zealand tech companies, or indeed more widely across the economy, um, where their staff become these mini United Nations of people. Um, and even um, quite recent immigrants quite quickly acculturate first into the culture of the company um, and then uh, find their own way to give their own expression of, of what it means to be a New Zealander and um, uh, and the, the way they then work in those companies and the way they contribute more widely in society is um, is, is a delight and that's um, whilst we're the most immigrant intensive place in the country, um, you'll find that in all our um, towns and cities, um, however small. Um, and any reflections from you both about how connecting in with, with New Zealand is compared to other places you've connected in, in with? Like I know that each of you have spent times in, in lots of different parts of the world um, and even, you know, formed homes in, uh, in new places before coming to New Zealand. So, how, you know, how would, how would your experience connecting in with New Zealand compare to different places where you've we have landed. Um, I'm going to tell a, a story against us uh, or against New Zealand in one sense. Um, when I um, arrived um, 20 years ago, um, it was a very warm welcome. It was a, a, a bigger welcome and a, um, than I had and a more open one than I had received in the States um, and then uh, later in Canada. Um, which was wonderful. But then I realized after a while, there was this sort of slightly unsaid thing, this kind of little sort of glass ceiling that, um, and it started to come out. There was this expectation I was only here for a while before I'd be moving on. You know, why are you here? Why, why didn't you go back to London? And um, um, when I uh, was making it very clear I was staying and the years went by, um, then I felt that I, I, I got through that, semi-invisible barrier but that's changed a very great deal um, I, I think um, over these um, years particularly say over the last 10 um, there's a, uh, a real sense of confidence and purpose here um, and also of course um, a greater appreciation that um, this is, um, is a very good place to live and work uh, where um, democracy still works and you know, all sorts of other things are in somewhat better shape in, than in some other countries. So that's gone away. I think um, people now are thinking, well, you know, welcome to New Zealand. It's lovely to have you here. You've made a good choice. You know, it's gone in the old days is when are you leaving? <laughs> any any reflections from you, Michelle, because you um, compared to settling in the States or, or different different places? Yeah, I found it much easier, I think, to settle here in New Zealand, which I figured out how it worked. And actually, that's changed a lot since I've been here because I moved here 10 years ago. And now if I think about people I know who've moved here recently, there are so many meetup groups and events. Every night there is a free event going on somewhere. Um, and the co-sharing spaces and the startup spaces actually all invite you in. So I think it's become even easier to connect with people here and there are welcoming spaces where you can do that um, and I think actually those co-sharing spaces and those innovation hubs actually are filled with people who are incredibly connected with likely the people that you would need to find when you get to New Zealand and so I think it's become even more easy to um to settle in very quickly and find the people that you know are your tribe um, than even when it was 10 years ago. Uh, and any any words of advice for anyone who's wanting to come to New Zealand? Like any thoughts of what they should be thinking about? You know, what sort of prep should they do before they come, or what sh what should they be aware of? Or you know, once they arrive here, how should any any tips for them to connect in? 
Um, well, uh, I think the first one is, um, if you're an English speaker, don't be confused by what seems to be a common language, um, because um, in, in sort of subtle ways, you'll realize it isn't. Um, and uh, this isn't, you know, England from a few years back or, or whatever. Um, and so just being very open um, to the difference, to the nuance, um, I think it's an important thing. And um, but at the same time to, um, you know, be confident about um, yourself, but also then crucially about your confidence to adapt. I get lots of calls from um, New Zealanders who have been overseas for a while, or indeed some non New, New Zealanders who think of emigrating here, who, who want to talk about what it's like here. And um, I think the essential point I make to them is that the job you have done overseas is almost certainly not available here because as a small country, uh, we tend to multitask. We tend, our, our jobs can be, tend to be less specialized um, and we have a slightly different way of working. So it, you can't just say, well, I did this overseas, so I'll do exactly that in New Zealand. You just need to sort of work out how to slightly kind of repurpose yourself and how to find ways to make your experience um, and your knowledge um, useful here. So it's just a quick, I think those are some of the, um, the transitions that you go through um, as, you, as you settle in New Zealand. Uh, the big one for me is I always recommend that people don't commit to housing or where they're going to live until they've actually come here and visited. Um, housing in New Zealand is very different than I think anywhere else I've lived in the world through its different diversity in housing. And so um, I always suggest that people try and, you know, Airbnb or stay somewhere for a month first to figure out actually the type of housing they're interested in and, and the suburb that they would like to live in or the city. Um, because New Zealand really does differ from place to place and it's great to find somewhere that you would settle without committing on you know a year's rental for a place that isn't for you. It's also been very uh, fascinating with the um, overseas fellows um, in the first two cohorts because um, um, many of them have taken exactly that sort of advice that Michelle's offering and have taken their time to work out um, where they might be. And um, certainly at least one fellow in the second cohort, sorry, two fellows I think in the second cohort have settled in Dunedin, um, a small, smallish town at the other end of the country. So it's not necessarily all about Auckland as our largest city or Wellington as the capital or Christchurch as the largest city in the South Island. Um, um, Travel between centres um, uh, is is easy. I say that cautiously because some of those internal Air New Zealand flights can be quite expensive. Um, but um, th there is that sort of connection around the country. So it is well worth taking your time just to get to know various places and, and um, find one that um, makes good sense to you in terms of where the best colleagues are and where the, the best lifestyle is for you. And um, earlier, Rod, you alluded to not being trapped into the, the thought that the, the language is the same, so maybe the culture is the same. But any, any thoughts on, on um, how you would describe how New Zealand culture is different, or uh, both of you, I guess, to say, I don't know, what people might be familiar with from, say, the UK or the US, for example? Yes. Um, like, um, let me start with some myths of a sort, because every country, every society has them. Um, we do have a, a long history of considering ourselves very egalitarian, and, and that is, was true in part. Um, it's not such a, it was not such a class-conscious society, and, and still isn't today, um, compared with, with many countries. Um, but there are um, big disparities in um, income and wealth um, in the country, and um, especially the disparity in wealth rather than income um, has um, become more exacerbated in recent years. The, um, another big one is um, it's really quite fascinating how much of Maori culture has just kind of seeped into you know, Pākehā culture. And um, it, um, when I first turned up here and was having meetings at the newspaper I was 
the new business editor at, I couldn't understand quite how the meetings were working and, and people just kind of seemed to walk in and nobody seemed to be particularly in charge and there was this kind of checking in with each other to see how they all were. And I was used to going into a meeting, there was an agenda, someone's in charge and you just plow straight into it. And it was only when I made my first visit to a Marae um, and uh, was welcomed on to a Marae by um, a local Maori iwi and that I realized that there was all sorts of um, uh, customs, protocols, tikanga um, of um, uh, Maori that had kind of seeped into the into sort of the rest of the culture and, and language too in terms of some of the words we use and um, and then there's a very strong Polynesian influence as well here um, from people who have come down from the um, Pacific Islands so um, those are some of the big ones um, let me just add one more one which I think is a bit problematic for us um, which is um, we're not as good in New Zealand as some countries are, some societies are in dealing with conflict. So what I do see distressingly too often um, is say in an organization or in a company, there's a tension or so in, or more, it gets swept under the carpet and, and people really aren't addressing the issues until it all blows up in a, a, a pretty, messy way. So I think that can be one of the downsides of a small society. But having said that, um, that's by no means um, a blanket comment about um, how we deal with things in New Zealand. And I think especially um, in very fast moving areas um, of the economy um, or society, um, obviously, technology, uh, the fast moving technology sectors would be part of that. Um, we're starting to see more and more um, organizations that uh, are developing an open culture um, where um, we can relate more productively to each other. So that would be the, the, um, the one comment of a, a more negative nature I'd make about a small country. But I want to emphasize that um, I think that I know that that's improving. Uh, considerably. And the thing is that um, life is not, um, uh, by and large, is, is not um, quite as confrontational um, as it can be um, in, in some other countries, some other societies. And so there is a, um, that, that makes it, um, you know, a good place to be. I think one of the things that I found really surprising having moved here from the US where I was so used to working seven days a week fast-paced always running getting things done um, the pace it wasn't slower here but what I found really interesting is people take time off in January and when I say people I mean most of the country and so <laughs> as somebody now who runs their own business I have to plan my calendar around knowing that literally in January it's very unlikely that the things that I would like to do are going to get done because the majority of New Zealanders are away on holiday enjoying the sunshine being on the beach and having quality family time and when I first moved here I was so frustrated because I'd come here with this fast pace of what are people doing how can they take so much time off and as I have been here longer and I realize the importance of um, creativity and time away from from you know your desk and, and your job to actually be creative in your space um, I realise the power of that and the fact that the whole country does it, I think is why it's a very creative country. But you really have to realise that January is not the time to get big, <laughs> big decisions done um, in your industry because um, very few people are at work. Yeah, I, I was always uh, right from the outset when I first uh, told my colleagues in London that we were, my family and I were moving to New Zealand. They said, oh, you're going for the lifestyle. And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm going for the work style. You know, it's just a, you know, a smaller country, be able to multitask, relate to people differently. Um, and I still say that is absolutely true. Um, it, it, is, it, uh, it is absolutely true about many aspects of the lifestyle. Um, not the least of which, uh, you know, a reasonably benign climate, um, although highly variable, little rain, little sun, little wind, you know, all in one morning. Um, but, um, but the, 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 say the work style, how, pe how people come together to work um, is often very, very attractive too. 
Cool. Okay. So if you want a decision made, don't, don't do that in January. And if you want to go to the supermarket, don't do it in Easter. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, okay. So, um, by the way, for all of our, um, participants, feel free to ask any questions in the Q and a box and we can put that to the group. Um, switching gears slightly. So I'm interested, interested rather to hear your experiences of once you arrived in New Zealand, um, and, and the work that you're doing and the innovative things that you're doing, how you found that kind of carving out your niche. And you mentioned Rod that, you know, have to re kind of reshape, um, compared to how things are done overseas. But I'm interested in how you've found New Zealand as an environment for you to um, work and do the interesting things that you do. Um, the thing that struck me first of all um, was how amazingly approachable people were, but how generous they were um, in sharing contacts. Um, and that's, I, I know that's completely true today. And um, obviously everybody keeps a few really special contacts up their sleeves, particularly um, uh, really famous or hard to get to people at home and abroad, understandably. But in terms of sharing um, those networks and contacts more widely, and um, m my sense is that people um, will make a fairly quick judgment that from what they've heard about you or what they see about you, you're okay. And therefore they will, they might introduce you into their network and it's kind of up to you to see how you get on, sink or swim, rather than um, somebody being a bit more um, constrained and say, well, I, I really want to see how this person works out before I put them in, you know, in with my, some of my best friends and colleagues. Um, so, so that sense is a big one. Uh, in terms of um, how, how that innovation works. Um, it's really hard to generalize though about how the nature of innovation works across the country because um, sometimes it can be very quick um, and, um, and sometimes reasonably commercially focused and um, other times um, it can be kind of all over the shop. Um, and um, you know there is a, a great um, tradition here of um, people tackling ridiculously big um, ideas or questions and um, and bringing a real creativity to it in a in a very useful way and um, I think again a shift in in uh, possibly say the last 10 years that those um, innovation systems uh, and more crucially the whole ecosystems around innovation um, has um, improved greatly in terms of the depth and capability there. And um, a big event for us um, in recent years has been Tech Week uh, with lots of events around the country. And um, I was um, particularly struck this Tech Week in May uh, as I was around the country with various events. Um, that sense of um, a, 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 a far more efficient and capable innovation ecosystem starting to develop. Of course, it's, n it's nothing like the scale or the sophistication of Silicon Valley or other major places in the world. Um, but um, I think there are some particular attributes that we can bring um, um, to that process that makes it um, distinctive and uh, in some ways um, perhaps a bit more creative um, and, and, and sometimes more effective. Yeah, I am, <coughs> sorry, as a nanotechnologist, obviously um, hardware and equipment is, um, is what I deal with. And, you know, New Zealand doesn't have all of the equipment but you know what, that actually made it easier for me to do things because it made me value. So I would go overseas to run some experiments, for example, and it would give me time here to be creative about what that time was going to be and make that time more efficient. Mm. Um, but then once I was here and realized I didn't have access to everything, it made me really, <coughs> sorry, really value that time when I was away and then be able to bring that expertise back here. Um, so actually it made me more efficient, I think, in how I became, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> All right, I'm back. How I became innovative and made me think about what happened when I did have limited resources here and actually it made me more impactful because previously I literally could tinker with anything I wanted and didn't always know what I was doing. I was like, well, we'll try this button and we'll try that button. Whereas the time here in New Zealand when I first started um, and I didn't have access to all the things that I thought would help me, made me realize that I didn't need most of those things and actually it helped me really to focus on 
what made impact, what was amazing. And then I could spend quality time doing that. And so that was really valuable for my time because it made me use my time more efficiently. And what about that exploration phase for you, Michelle, as, as you've gone to create now it's nanogirl labs and lots of other things that you've done. And, um, um, yeah, how did you find kind of getting that off the ground and kind of figuring out what, what the venture is that you're doing from, um, from the get go? Oh, moving to New Zealand has made me more creative than I think I've ever been in my life. And it has allowed me the freedom to be able to create, you know, my own organization, my own social enterprise to concentrate on the things that I am passionate about, which is education around technology. Um, I don't think I would have done that anywhere else, but here, partly because I've met so many passionate people, partly because New Zealand is a great place to pilot things. And so I could do things at small scale and then expand them overseas. Um, and New Zealand is great for that. We've had, um, we've sold a lot of our products overseas where we've been able to show through pilot and trial data in New Zealand that the concept would work in other countries. And other countries have been very um, appreciative of that data saying, if we know it works in New Zealand, we know it will work in, and we've exported to Singapore and Hong Kong and Abu Dhabi and, um, and the UK. And so that's been really helpful to be able to just tinker here, show a proof of concept, and then be able to sell that product offshore. Um, but yeah, I have been more creative here, I think partly because of the work style or lifestyle um, allowing me to, you know, really think about what is important. And partly because living in a beautiful country like New Zealand, you really appreciate your impact and your footprint on the planet. Um, and it made me think about, you know, what I wanted to leave behind and what I wanted to create to help increase that positive footprint on the world to make sure that you know our footprint is um, not left behind in a in a carbon offset point of view but actually the footprint we leave is one about um, education and empowering the next generation and so yeah living here and being surrounded by like-minded people really helps you to focus on what your priorities are and what is important thanks um one other reminder for participants to add in any other questions we've we've got time here um but um another question from me is around okay so what would you advise for people who who have a venture and are looking at bringing a venture to new zealand and trying to figure out how they'll you know expand that and get that off the ground um any thoughts for for how to do that in new zealand uh, after you michelle or slide jump back in um okay i'll start with if you want to start a venture in new zealand if you have an existing venture already and you want to bring it new to New Zealand um, don't expect that you could just bring it and dump it here and it will work um, always come and test the waters because it it's not quite it's not quite as easy as coming here and, and and trying it and dropping it in if you don't already have a venture and you want to come here um, don't start it until you've done a little bit of networking funding sources in New Zealand um, are are here you can get funding for your startup um, they're just not always in the most obvious of places and they typically come through through networking actually there are um, lots of investors here in, in, and organizations that do invest but it does take a little bit of time um, on the ground here so I would say to people don't jump straight in come here sort of um, spend a couple of months sort of figuring out who you need to know and what you need to know um, and then everybody will help you to, to set it up um, in a way that will work for New Zealand. Mm. I, I would just um, reinforce that message that that's a very, very uh, important investment in some time um, and effort to just get a feel for the place. And um, given that um, um, being a small country and the close connections between people, um, you can do that um, quite reasonably quickly, certainly quicker than uh, other countries. Don't think of that as a daunting prospect. Um, think of it as um, an exciting one uh, to come and spend a little time here and get that sense of um, how your idea um, and your ambitions um, um, will, might well morph a bit once you're here and you talk to people and see what's on offer um, and, um, and find yourself influenced by that. Um, but do make that investment. It sounds from what you're both saying, and this is my experience as well, that relational connections are maybe relatively more important here compared to other places. Um, so just to, yeah, emphasize and getting to know people and figuring out the lay, the lay of the land here. 
Um, and I'd be interested as well, Roger, switching tack again to hear your experiences as an EHF fellow. So I'd be interested to hear, you know, how you've how you found that experience of being a fellow and how that's how that's supported you and supported the work that you do. Yeah. Um, there is uh, so much to the uh, fellowship um, of great value. Um, and um, one of them is um, the mix of um, fellows from overseas and New Zealanders. So in my cohort, there's um, six of us New Zealanders and the uh, 22 from um, overseas. And um, that ratio has been, um, I think, reasonably consistent in the second and bigger cohort. Uh, and, um, and and will progress. It's a lovely combination because um, on one hand, uh, I thought I knew lots of people from the country, but I met some new people who are New Zealand fellows. So, uh, so it was the great joy in that. Um, but then um, in the week we spent together, it initially as a welcome week, October of last year, um, it was terrific to have that time to get to know the other fellows. And um, quite a few of them had come with their partners, or, um, and so we were meeting them too, uh, which was a, a, a very, very rich experience. Now, as you know from the, um, the material about EHF, the application process, Basically, we fall into two categories, either innovators or investors. And I'm a bit of a hybrid because of the nature of the work I do as a journalist. So um, my wife and I have um, our small investors, um, our biggest investment um, overall, though, has been in a social enterprise and um, the others in some tech enterprises. Um, and um, in terms of innovation, um, I, as a journalist, I'm trying to work out what on earth is the business model that is going to support good journalism in a small country? Uh, and I'm working with some great colleagues on that. So um, and as an investor, um, the main investment I'm making um, in my fellow fellows is in my um, knowledge of New Zealand and my networks here, uh, whether they be New Zealand fellows or overseas ones. Um, and... The um, next big step in this process, which is still shaping up, is um, my central preoccupation uh, as a business journalist is how on earth do seven and a half billion people now, how will 10 billion people uh, live well within the biosphere? Uh, and um, how, how radical are the changes, the values, everything else that needs to happen? And um, uh, so the next stage for me uh, is to build out my relationships uh, across the cohorts um, to um, expand that area of my work. And there's already some terrific people involved in that. Um, and um, the idea of us um, as a, 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 a stream, if you like, amongst the fellows um, to develop some projects, um, to develop um, some very powerful things to say um, out to New Zealand and around the country. That's the next big step. Um, and um, I'd hope that um, in this coming year, which will be my second year as a fellow, um, I will be able to um, uh, progress with my fellows on that. So um, this first year um, has um, largely been getting to know each other. Um, People who are coming cold into the country and setting up here have obviously got a different task as opposed to somebody who's already well established like me. But in a sense, my um, already being well established um, and uh, means that um, I'm having to sort of carve out space and give up some stuff uh, to create more time for EHF. So it's kind of been like the reverse problem, if you like, or the reverse challenge. And um, anyway, um, I'm progressing on all of those fronts and, um, and hugely loving it. And um, again, it's the quality of the engagement. I mean, the, the new frontiers get together's conferences, whatever you like to call them, uh, astonishing speakers. Um, in April, our most recent one, we had Johan Rockström from the Stockholm Resilience Centre here, who spent three days with us, which was remarkable for somebody who is such a, a global expert and in, in such great demand. And he was so generous with his time. There's just wonderful, wonderful conversations. Um, so that was uh, very thr um, thrilling for me personally. Um, thanks for that, Rod. Um, I'll, I'll give one last final call for any questions. So um, do send them through quickly. 
Um, other, otherwise, we're, we're about at the end of the call. Um, but it just, I'll put it back to Michelle and Rod. Any, any, other, any other, actually, we've got a question that's come through. But um, Rod and Michelle, I'll, I'll um, see the thought for you, which is just to, um, any other final comments for people who are thinking about moving to New Zealand? Um, okay, so our question is, if anyone's not selected for the fellowship but wants to connect with some of the existing fellows, how can he or she do that? Um, so the, what I would suggest, the best way to do that would be to come along to the New Frontiers Summit. Um, so you can go to newfrontiers.nz um, is the website, or you can Google it, New Frontiers. Um, and that's a way, that's, I would say, the best place to connect with fellows. And there'll be fellows there from across different cohorts. Um, but I'll, I'll, leave, I'll pass it back now to Rod and Michelle for any, any final comments, um, words of advice for people thinking about connecting more with New Zealand. Um, and then after that, we can wrap up the call unless there are any other questions from our participants. Michelle, or would I? I'm, I'm just going to say do it. Like, just do it. It's everybody I know who has done it and who has come here has created an, a magical, adventurous journey that, um, that I have never seen anybody regret. And so I say, yes, it's an incredible place. It's probably not what you're expecting. It's probably so much more. So definitely do it. And although we seem far away, um, apart from Australia, any, anywhere is a minimum of a 12 hour flight. Just think of that as a mini film festival. Now there's even on demand films in, you know, economy class. Just sit back and select your films, have a bit of a snooze, um, a, a bit of dinner and uh, heck, and then you're here in New Zealand. It, just like that. Fantastic. Hey, um, Rod and Michelle, thank you so much for your time and thanks for sharing your experiences. Um, and thank you for everyone who's joined us and for, for those who will be watching this afterwards. Um, thank you. See ya. Thank you.